call this 77th meeting of the Jacksonville Tourism Development Authority order. Our first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. I'd like to hear a motion. I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Second item on the agenda is to approve the minutes for our February 25th, 2021 meeting. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Great. Okay. We'll proceed to our new business today. Um, we're going to have a revenue update and budget discussion led by our Gail Maids. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're going to just take a really brief look at the collection summary. This is um, the monthly summary compares this year to last year. As you can see, this year we're a little below where we were last year. The light blue light, uh, bars are the current year. And we're still not into the area where the, the stays dropped off. You'll see in March and April. If you remember, April was the lowest month we had ever had in the history of collection of the taxes. So this is how, how we're running. It's not terrible, but um, we're running monthly. Oops, went right by that one. And then this is each year compared, and you can see FY19 was our largest year of collections. This is only January year to date for each year, so it's comparative number of months. Um, so we're still like at our third highest year so far this year. And then um, we wanted to just give you a brief overview of what the budget, it, the budget is included in your documents. Um, for FY22, we're proposing to budget $975,000 for occupancy tax. We've been around a million dollars for the last couple of years. Actually, it was a million and a half in FY19, like I said, it was the largest year we had. So this is a really conservative estimate. And then we have occupancy tax penalties of $2,000 and investment earnings of $375. Yes, it's pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives us a total revenue budget of $977,000. And then for the expenses, these are the categories that are required under the general statute. And it is what it is. We've got administration expenses, um, and one-third goes to tourism promotion and two-thirds goes to other tourism-related expenses. That's prescribed in the law. But we have a little more detail. For the administration, 19750 is budgeted to go to the city for collecting the fee. The audit is $5,550. Uh, that, that includes some advertising, I believe, for the audit. Um, insurance is $600. The finance officer has to have a bond, and I think each of you are covered with a, a small bond for your service on the, on the board. Um, and those penalty revenues, 90% of that goes to the Board of Education, so that's the $1,800. And then credit card fees, we allow um, the businesses to pay online with their credit card, and we pay, a, a, I think it's about 3% fee for those who choose to do that. So those are the proposed administrative expenses. And then when we get to the promotion, I don't think we've really made too many um, decisions yet. There's Sturgeon City historically has been funded, Sports Commission. The event promotion is, of course, yeah, those events that we pay for the advertising to promote. And then marketing is the ladies here to my... Uh, right and then anything else that is promotion related and again the total of that for the current year would be three hundred and fourteen thousand dollars and somewhere here i wrote there's a fund balance of about a million dollars that we can also spend on these items and then the tourism related that's where the sturgeon city debt payment of one hundred fifty thousand comes from Historically, we've done signage and other projects, and there is about $2.1 million in fund balance in this area. And those are just some 
minor details of where we're spending the money. Um, any questions related to the budget? Yes. Um, for right now, until we make other decisions, mm -hmm. the only money that's that's coming out is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The only money coming out of the tourism related is one hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty. Is that correct? Yes, sir. No other as um, as we sit here t today. We do have some money that we're probably going to transfer this current year to the city because we've started on the signs, on the um, the wayfinding signs. I don't believe we've started on the, we've done a little bit on the Beirut Memorial and the um, those two signs, but we, do, we did promise to help with those two, and that money has not been transferred out, but. Let me address that if we could. Uh, those are not items that we believe uh, that you have authorized us to spend money on. And therefore, the only thing that's shown out of that category that is a, what I'll call a guaranteed expenditure on your part is 150000 Now, the wayfinding signs, uh, that's what I'll call incidental money. And I know later we're going to talk about the ad hoc committees. But those are the type of things that we'll be discussing with the ad hoc committees and then eventually, if you do ad hoc committees, and then eventually back to the full board. But what we have not done is to assume that you're going to fund any of those. So all of that is in play. Gail, I believe you also wanted to talk about uh, the advertisement and the potential adoption of their budget because it is, for all practical purposes, the... You know, April is upon us. Yes, sir. Um, general statute requires that you hold a public hearing, even though it's prescribed in the law how you have to budget. But um, if you, if it pleases the board, we could schedule that for April 29th, I think. Okay. Is that your recommendation on holding the public hearing or public hearing and potential adoption? Well, I mean, you can adopt it at the same time if that's if there's no one here to speak or if we've got pretty much yes, in the past. Exactly. the practice. Sounds like a good So we'll schedule it for the public hearing right. and potential adoption right. at the next meeting in April. Anything else there? Are we gonna go to the uh, audit? Contract. Discuss. I didn't have any uh, slides for this. This is just the um, annual audit contract. The city uses the firm of Cherry Beckert LLP, and uh, the Tourism Development Authority went out to bid at the same time with the city. It, it brings in a better price for both entities if we use the same one, because they only have to look at how we process payments once, and they and it saves a little money, but. General statute requires that you authorize the audit contract and the appointment or the exer exercising of our opportunity to extend that contract one year, each year. So basically we need a motion to approve the contract. To extend the contract, oh, and, audit contract. and approve the audit contract. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I recommend the authority approve the audit contract as presented and authorize submission to the L. A second. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Okay. Move right along. Oh, good. We're getting to our marketing report. We're going to hear from Teresa Beecham and Susan Dozier. And looking forward to it. Hi. Hello. I didn't feel like I haven't been here in quite some time. Um, what we want to do is keep it as brief as possible, but give you a, a, as thorough as we can in the amount of time that we have, a, a marketing update that will include uh, current climate of traveler sentiment, what travelers are thinking in their head, how they're feeling about moving around, um, and some will be, it, it will also include a, a quick recap and, and some review for anybody that's new, I, Bob's new, and Randy, you probably haven't heard it as much as some of the others, but some of it will be things that you've heard and some maybe not. Um, we'll start with talking about um, the current travel um, indicators. Visit and see is um, they contract with the National 
research firm, Destination Analysts. And they are they do a lot of research. They do it for all tourism related. They do for um, hotel, lodging. They do for um, hotels. I mean, uh, airports and tourism. It's a lot of tourism. So Visit NC is contracted with them, and they have been reporting. Last year, they're reporting weekly, and we attended attended weekly presentations for an hour a week. Then about third quarter, I think they moved into bi-weekly and then eventually, I think November or December, moved into monthly. So we're still attending those and still keeping a, a, a good finger on the polls. Um, since December, we've seen a turn in how people feel about traveling. Prior to that, there was so much hesitation. We didn't do a lot um, other than the marketing grant that we received that you remember us talking about from uh, state, from government. And we didn't pay for that, but we received $50,000, and the county received $100,000. So um, what this research is showing now uh, through mid-January is the most recent. Well, I think we saw in February, so it might be through February. The um, indicators are showing that 60% of people who travel or intend to travel, they're ready to travel. There's a pent-up desire to travel. 20% need a little bit more time, and I foresee Ken asking what happened to the other 20%, so I'll go no, ahead I'm and in tell the you. 60. <laughs> <laughs> the other 20%, I suppose, are holding off um, and waiting to hear, see what the vaccines do. Um, so current regional indicators that we're looking at are hoteliers, and I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, when we get to the end, to the questions, I'd love to hear some input from you guys. But from the ones that we've talked to, it seems to be that things are looking better. Uh, I believe you mentioned that in the last meeting. And also, uh, we heard before the last meeting that someone has, e I mean, people are starting to see travelers, even from as close as Newburn, that are just wanting to escape. They just want to get out and, and move around. So that's one indicator. Um, another indicator that we might look at is our local airport. In December, they ran at 90% capacity. So of the flights that they had, they were 90% booked. The statistics or the, the stats that I've received from Chris are for 2020, he ran at 75% of his travel numbers over 2019. So 75% is a pretty strong number, a pretty good indicator. Our local airport is tracking at a higher percentage than the national average and then a state average. It, uh, through the end of January, Chris uh, said that they ran 15% higher than the average for the state. We were actually the highest percentage of, 19, of 20 over 19 travelers of any airport in the state of North Carolina. Only second to, uh, right behind was uh, Fayetteville and then Asheville. And Asheville, as you know, is just huge travel destination period, which is an indicator to me that people want to travel. They're gonna start traveling. So uh, lucky for us that we have the base <clears throat> is what we take from that, you know, from, from us in Fayetteville. Uh, current traveler sentiment is um, on the latest research is showing that people of the people that were, who were ready to travel, the first wave of bookings came in January. A lot of people booked for the beach already. I have a couple of beach clients that I talk to uh, on the regular, and they're booked for the front row. I mean, you can't get oceanfront through the rest of the summer. So uh, that is true. April and May is what they expect to be the next um travel period, uh, booking travel period. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and they will book 2021 20, summer trips and fall trips. So there's a, a, a definite desire uh, to travel. And it also shows that a lot of people are indicating that initially they're interested, uh, for the leisure traveler at least, probably will take fewer trips this year. However, they're looking at road trips and it will depend on um, the vaccines and economy will dictate that to a degree. So, uh, but they're ready to travel and they're looking at road trips, drivable locations within about a three hour market from their home. <clears throat> 
Um, I wanted to go back and talk just a little bit about who our North Carolina traveler is. Um, for those of you that haven't yet met me yet, um, I work very closely with Teresa and Kim, and um, I've been on this account for about Almost Three, five. Almost five years, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and I, I do tours and PR across the Carolinas. Um, our North Carolina visitor, when I first came, I, I was at Southern Living for about 18 years as an editor and writer before I came into, some say the dark side, I will not call it that, the bright side of public relations <laughs> and marketing. And um, I, my number one client was Visit North Carolina, and I was their PR director. When I made that shift, um, one of the things, I, I had to do a lot of homework to be on the marketing side, and I was really surprised that the number one reason, even 15 years ago, that people come, <laughs> Rick's nodding, that people come to North Carolina to visit is to visit family and friends. Chris, you're nodding too. Um, that is especially interesting for us as we imagine that base full of young men and women and, and, and the grandmas and grandpas that haven't seen them in a while. Um, and, and then in that mix, if you even if you ever just do a fun, fun challenge and you look at our Visit Jacksonville Facebook page, the pictures that get the most like and the most interaction, they're all pictures with national, natural scenic beauty. The one that you see on the slide here is a great example. If you look at the Visit North Carolina um, social media, you'll see that same thing. There's a reason people post those beautiful pictures of outdoors is because that's what people want when they think about that North Carolina brand. Out of it, and with some new research, that, and I called up my friends at Visit NC, and I said, what you got new? And some things were exactly the same, like visiting family and friends. But the latest numbers about how people are doing their travel planning is that 80% of them are doing it online. They're using their computer and their phone. So now, why do people actually come to Jacksonville? Or what is the, the bait that we're going to put out? We know that we're going to get some people. Can you just advance for me? Anyway? Yes, I can. I'm sorry, thanks. Um, we know that some people are going to come regardless. But our, our goal here is to extend the stay if they are coming to, to visit somebody on the base. And then I think there's an incredible opportunity if we actually just let people know that there is a Jacksonville, North Carolina. A lot of, of it's interesting the way Visit North Carolina has come to know us in the last five years and that kind of thing. So first of all, we've got to do that handshake and say, hey, we're Jacksonville, North Carolina. There's more here than just a military base. But we are influenced by that. So if you think about um, the bait we're putting out, it's in three buckets. You, some of you who have been here for a while have heard me refer to this as a three-legged stool. Okay? It's military, it's sports and events, and it's outdoors. Let's dig a little deeper into that. So if we're talking about military, we talked about visiting friends and family. Those people are going to get, gonna wanna go to Lejeune Memorial Gardens. One of the most interesting stories as a writer and a journalist that I've uncovered here is our ethnic cuisine. Just this morning, I found this fabulous El Cerro Pender, Oh, my Spanish is bad, Pandera. Anyway, it's a Mexican bakery, and it's right on the way into Walmart off Yop Road. Um, fabulous, fabulous Mexican baked goods. You have access to people who are coming doing incredibly authentic ethnic cuisines that I have never seen in a city of this size. And it is total bait for writers who are looking to cover new things. Food is hot. Food is a gateway to a younger um, audience. It's also a gateway to an older audience that will drop some money to have it. So your ethnic cuisine is certainly something to me. And, and a lot of that ethnic cuisine is tied to veterans and veterans' family members who visited here, decided to stay and cook. If we look at sports and events, the Grand Prix series runs that we have, there is not any place else. Well, I think there is one run where you can get the Marine, a Marine in their dress blues to put the medal around your neck when it's finished. I've learned in the running community, it's all about that medal. And so that's a very, very unique thing that we have. Um, I've had writers in Charlotte to compete in the um, St. Patty's Day run, the one that first one I brought, she won her category. But it's something that people do. We talked to, to a young group of women from Hickory, the fastest growing audience in those runs is women. And, and we have an incredible opportunity to continue to bring people here. Um, and it's already drawing people, but we have an opportunity to amplify that. We've talked in the past about our sports commission and the things that they're doing, the New River Splash, and how it highlights the cleanup and the amazing sets here on the New River and tournaments. As we keep going, 
um, we'll talk about the outdoors. And to me, this is one of our juiciest pieces of bait here. Now, it, the Grand Canyon, yes, people are gonna travel to the Grand Canyon, but why will they come to Jacksonville? Well, let's drill down on that a little bit. We've got the New River. It's, it's less expensive to go to the New River than it is to go to the beach, even though the beach is just 30 minutes away. We have um, kayaking, fishing, bayonet cruises. Um, they just launched their new season this week. We've done a lot of work with them on social. And um, Lance took out his first cruise actually last night. The weather was finally good enough and, and he launched. So that is a major draw for us. And it's something that we've partnered with him quite a bit with our media people to get the, the word out about that. And we've used pictures of Lance and Marilyn on their boat in our ads. And we're also just 30 minutes away. So you don't have to drop $3,000, $5,000 for a week to get hotel front hotels at the beach. That's great, Onslow's all over that. But you can actually stay in our hotels for a weekend and you don't have to give up your firstborn to enjoy some of that great outdoors and natural scenic beauty. I think that's an important positioning for us. So if we look at what we're gonna do then, knowing that we're gonna use these three-legged stool, the bait, the three different places, where, where are we gonna use that bait and how are we gonna deploy it? Um, first, we'll be a part of the Visit North Carolina conference coming up in April, um, it, it's virtual, so that saves us some more money there. They'll roll out a pretty extensive advertising program at that time, and we'll um, put in some orders. Now, what they do is they get their, I, I see your, <laughs> well, I would, go ahead, Randy. You put in some orders? For yeah, placing orders for advertising and, and different kinds. So Visit North Carolina gets their agency to negotiate down at a considerable discount some of the opportunities for us to all come in and advertise together. And so some of it's digital. Some of it will be traditional print kinds of things. Some of it, it will be like with Weather Channel. There's all kinds of different things. The Google My Business program that we just did um, right before Christmas, that's one of the options. So they'll be putting together these packages. And then the more partners that buy in, they can administer the ads all at once or in big swoops. And so it saves them time and money. And it helps those outlets and publications and vendors, um, you know, secure their plan for the year so they're willing to discount. So it's a great way for us to take advantage of some things we might not be able to afford on our own and, and save a little cash and get very targeted things that are very appropriate for our audience. Um, we were also, we'll execute our, our state advertising buy. Um, we do that with um, Onslow County Tourism. And it, one of just, just your basics, and Teresa knows this even better than me, is if you're buying print or if you're doing any kind of advertising, if you do it just once, you might as well just lay down and throw your money away. Nobody remembers a one, <laughs> my, my advertisers in the group are nodding. Nobody remembers that. You want that consistency in there. And since we partner with Onslow Tourism, we have a chance to each one take turns and we're still pushing that outdoor message, the natural scenic beauty, the sports, the different kinds of things like that. And and it gives us a chance to stay in front of those our state readers. If we're looking at North Carolina, and we're such a big, long state, um, you know, a lot of North Carolina still doesn't know that we're here. Um, how many of you in this room can tell me what county Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is in? Or, or. Oh, you all, of course, would. <laughs> uh, wrong audience. <laughs> my, 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 my mom couldn't tell you that or anything. Most so a people. lot of people, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, they don't necessarily always remember the county, but they'll usually remember the city, like Myrtle Beach, like New Bern, that kind of thing, even though New Bern is high in Hanover. I know that. So anyway, so, so you get that idea. So our state is really important print opportunity for us because so many of our state's traveling readers who want to visit something different, something new, something they can take pride in, that North Carolina pride. So I think that's a really important print buy for us. Um, we'll also be working, Teresa and her team will be finalizing the visitor's guide. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. And then originally in my three month plan that I gave to Richard, I had said, let's do a virtual media tour, an online media tour. I ditched that. Once I started to see, when we, we started tracking that travel sentiment, it was the same thing. My phone started ringing again and my email started coming in. Susan, you know, do you, I, I know you've talked a lot about Jacksonville. Do you think that they might be able to host us and that kind of thing? So we're feeling building a lot of, of, of interest right now. And, um, and, and so I'm not doing the digital thing, we're doing to do it for real, <laughs> so, hosting people. 
to continue on the three month plan and outlook, what we want to do is um, we'd like to place a, oh, well, let me back up and just tell you this. So 82, actually 82% of all travel is researched online. 60%, I think 68% is actually booked online. So it's huge. To take advantage of that, we want to put together a digital campaign. It, we can't afford, and most people can't afford, to uh, buy traditional media. You can't buy, we can't buy television and radio in every market that we want to talk to. But digitally, you can, we can afford to do that. It is a lot more cost effective to do that. So we've got some, some thoughts on how we want to do that. Uh, we want to target people two to three hours away and highlight specific interests. You can target them by interest and behavior and what, what they, their age. That's where um, those three-legged stool comes yes, in. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I'm just going to tell you now is the time. Um, it's, as more, it's as competitive right now as it's ever going to be for us. We need to let people know that Jacksonville's here. We've started doing that. We've been doing it for four, five, six years now. Um, and I really feel like we've made some headway indicated by some of the numbers. Um, and as every DMO shifts from our planning stage to what are we going to do when things start loosening up and people are willing to travel into the doing, what is our active stage? Um, it, it, it's go time. Right now it's go time. Not bow time. Go time. <laughs> Might be bow time, too. Um, and so we want to do that. We want to continue updating the website and uh, with some travel itineraries. That, those are important. And the reason they're important is because if someone sees a digital ad on Facebook or when they're searching something else online and we're retargeting them because they've already shown interest, they'll click on that ad. If they see something they like, we give them the bait and they like it and they click on that, we're going to take them to a page within our website that already has a basic itinerary outlined for them to give them a taste of Jacksonville. So here's, here's what your weekend might look like. You can choose from this long list of these things and it gives them a quick idea because right now in today's world, people aren't going to dig through a lot and read a lot. They want to know the basics. So you give it to them. You give them what they want. So we're focused on that, and we will be continuing to do that. Okay. Um, as we pitch media, I said, um, again, that we'd had that kind of focus. Um, we already have had an inquiry, and we've got... Um, with all, everything it, it, from our state. Now, I've been pitching our state since I very first started working on this job. And, and this one, they're doing a Memorial Day focus piece, and they're going to use Lejeune Memorial Gardens as the, as the kickoff. It's like the site that they're going to talk about, and then she's going to talk more about what Memorial Day means to her. Um, we're hoping to have um, Houston Chanel at, from the Montford Point Marine Association talk to her and hopefully Joe Hull. I've still got to get my phone call into Joe Hull and, and we'll give her an overview of the gardens. If, if two people can't help you understand what Memorial Day is, I can't imagine who else. And we have so many veterans in, in, in our area that can do that. But anyway, this is a story that's been five years in the making and I'm very, very, very excited about it. And she's going to come in May. It'll be for 2022, but she's coming in May. Um, we've already got plans to host Hadi Bellato, who's a Charlotte-based um, food writer and television personality. She does regular morning show segments for WRAL in Raleigh and for the Charlotte market. Um, Heidi's very excited about coming here and has already given me some very detailed thoughts on what she wants to see and where she wants to eat. And then we're looking at some more. Um, Salem is hosting a group that I had originally um, been the inviting person for, NC Tripping, a very, very popular North Carolina blog. She's getting them back for the second time. They weren't able to get on Bayonet the first time, so they're going to get on that when they come in April. Um, and then we're, we're looking at a lot of other people. I wanted to give you a definition. Um, that sometimes I'll say things and throw out stuff, and you'll be like, what is she talking about? So if I ever talk to you about an influencer or a blogger, I want to explain explain what that is. Um, bloggers write, a blog is an online website, usually written by one or two people. Together, there may be guest blogs, that kind of thing. And so the people who write those have to spend a lot of time 
driving traffic back. So a lot of people are reading it and other people want to work with them. Well, one of the ways they do that is to have robust social media sites. Um, Instagram, especially, when my editor at Southern Living, he would always say, Susan, marketing or writing, communicating is words and pictures. Well, Instagram has a big focus on the picture. So if you're in a market that already values natural scenic beauty, um, you can look and see how our Instagram feed and that of Visit North Carolina really focuses on those beautiful pictures. Well, people who have these big accounts, big Instagram accounts, what they do is, is they have so many people following them who literally want to know where they're going, want to know what's happening. Um, I, I have hosted some influencers where I've had people and I'm good at deciding which influencers are the right ones to come. I don't work with the people who won't give you results. But they'll like say, oh, I didn't ever think that restaurant was any good. Did you think it was good? And then the person will actually say to them, actually, yes, they were a little salty with this, but their cocktails are fabulous. I mean, there's this constant give and take with these influencers and this ongoing communication. Um, Chris can tell you when we had our influencers in and they met Regina. What's Regina's last name? It just left me. Yeah, Regina Treese, um, the waffle lady at their Hampton Inn, they blew up Instagram with pictures of Regina and her amazing waffles. And people still are asking me about Regina and is she still there and that kind of thing. So it actually makes a really big difference. It's not familiar to a lot of us who grew up in a very traditional advertising and marketing setting, but it makes all the difference today. So I'll also be securing some um, influencers and bloggers and things like that. And then I want to just tell you, so we were talking about bait. I want to talk to you about the bait that we use to get more coverage in the Visit North Carolina Travel Guide. Um, each of you have one. and Kim has detailed all the little sticky notes are, are stories. But before this travel guide, guess how many mentions we had in the North Carolina Travel Guide? Zero. We had zero. You're absolutely right, Ken. And I did not like that. None of our team liked that. And so we did a very targeted um, presentation to North Carolina based on what we knew their North Carolina visitor wanted. And let's look just quickly. I want to talk to you about this is what the North Carolina team heard about our destination and they bid on. This is the bait that they took. So there's 500,000 of these guys. In a story on interesting places to stay, Bayonet Cruises, which you can not only eat there, but stay overnight too. Of course, Onslow County gets a great mention with their beach. Um, Mike's Farm um, is in a big story that they did on agritourism. This is a place we have room to grow, and we're investigating some additional agritourism mm -hmm. outlets here. Um, the next one, it was a story on North Carolina originals. And, and I'm going to go ahead and get you to go to the next slide, Teresa. This was the only double truck spread, double truck, that's a magazine term, both sides of the, both pages, in the entire book. Went to us and the Montfort Point Marine Museum at Lejeune Memorial Gardens. I thought I was going to die with happiness. That, that is a huge, huge win for us, you guys. And then um, the last one was, um, one more, oh, Teresa, sorry. yeah, was um, Yo Breeze Dessert, a little tiny sweet shop here in Jacksonville, was one of six different destinations from across the state that they went into their Instagram feed, there again, Instagram, and found a little sweet bite to end the entire magazine. And they do a fabulous job with their Instagram. They are just pros they do. At, their, at their program, whoever's doing their stuff. So I, I did that to show you foods playing, Cool places to stay, that's playing. Our incredible state park, Swansboro was singled out as one of the state parks because of the shelling and the pristine beaches. Um, there are a lot of those kinds of things that we lay claim to and so does Onslow and that's where that interaction and, and, the, and the teamwork come from. So that's something I was pretty proud about. Um, we've already presented to them again for the 2022 travel guide and um, we'll see what they bite on for that. But that's just a little chance for you to understand what bait is working. We know they're thinking mm -hmm. that for the North Carolina traveler and then we'll do that for our traveler as well. I think one of the key takeaways for me in, in all of that is it takes time. Marketing is not a 
an immediate return a lot of times. If you give me a coupon, let's say, Rick, you want to give me a $40 night and somebody wants to give me a $20 you know, meal at Ducks or whatever the case may be, we can make that happen and we can show you that marketing works. But as a rule, it takes time and you don't always know there's so many moving parts. Uh, one of the um, things I wanted to mention on the heels of the visitor's guide is a visitor's guide, it seems like is not, it may be in some people's mind, not as important as it used to be. It has been the number one marketing tool for travel, for destinations for decades, and it truly still is. Some things have changed and people will go online and look at it online. But again, the state of North Carolina still prints 500,000 of them. So it's, uh, it, they, they need there, it's still relevant. We need to continue. Uh, influencer, it influences people's travel decisions. They are located in visitor centers and high traffic areas locally. In the visitor centers, people pick them up and they'll make a decision where they want to go. They'll pick up several things and it, you got to stand out on that rack, which is why we're working on our second one. You got to keep them updated. Um, I know that Salem manages the um, visitor centers and she gets calls from probably four or five of them that run out and request to be replenished. The airport, once people get here, I can't keep them in the airport. You can't give them enough. People come and they pick them up immediately and it's their guide to Jacksonville. So it's for visitors and first timers. Um, and so once they're here, they use it for a planning guide. Also, we have to remember that our local citizens are our number one ambassadors. We've got to keep keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing until people don't say anymore. Some people are still going to say it, and it happens in every destination. There's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. They need to know what we have, and a lot of people just don't know. <clears throat> so we need to continue with that. <clears throat> so I mentioned you know, uh, measuring success. And that's something every client I have and every client everywhere ask of their ad agencies or their advertising people. What am I getting for my money? Are people coming and spending the night immediately? I can't tell you that exactly until we have a tool in every hotel that says, you know, every person that checks in, we can keep up with it research-wise. What you can do is is measure your success by indicators. And some of those indicators are the occupancy tax obviously is speaks volumes. Um, and we know that we're not solely responsible for that, but we, we know that we contribute to that by getting our story out. Uh, website traffic and analytics um, of our campaigns are huge. If we're building our website traffic, that means more people are discovering us, more people want to know about us. If we run an ad campaign, for instance, and they send us the data that we look at uh, intensely. And you see this number of people, you know, saw the ad, so there are gross impressions, but they also, what we, what's more important to us is who took action, who liked what they saw, who went to the website. We can show that in the fourth quarter when we spent that $50,000 that didn't belong to us, that was free money. When we had that grant, we saw a tremendous growth in um, website traffic because we pushed them straight to the website. So we're exposing our, our, our community and our assets all the time. Um, and then the visitor's guide requests, the um, number of downloads, we can see that on the back end of the website. When you analyze the data, you can look at it and see who went to what page, what their behavior is on the website. And then we do still occasionally get requests for people that want the visitor's guide mailed to them. Not a lot of that anymore, but people are going to that page on the website. So we look at that as those are our indicators. If those are all moving forward, we're doing our job and the word is getting out and people are likely going to travel here and enjoy what we have to offer. So in a quick summary, does anybody remember how many of these guides were printed? 500,000. 500,000. How many are you printing of our local guide, Teresa? Uh, 20,000. That's what we printed last time. Perfect. Perfect. So... Um, we need to meet people where they are in the digital landscape, and we'll be starting a promotional push to our drive markets. And as Teresa said, the time is now. 
people are in their planning stages now. I think that having some of the beachfront properties booked, there's a way to, in, 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 to, to interrupt people before they even come to Jacksonville with targeted digital advertising that are right for us. And um, we can do that and we need to start now. And that's, that's what we propose between our, our digital, the print buy with our state, and then our media, our writers. Um, Every time a writer or a large website has a link back to our website, it bumps our website up in organic search. And so, and it gives, it tells Google, this is a credible, cool place and other people are writing about them. So that's another um, benefit of having our writers come. But that, that's what we're gonna do, is we're gonna, we're gonna get that traffic back up to, not back, but continue to, to build that website traffic. We'll be inviting writers and we'll push a big, big digital campaign. So that's our plan. Questions? That was fantastic. Yeah. Sorry it's so much. It is a lot. <laughs> but we tried to keep it concise, but it's hard to do. <laughs> it's been a while since you've been here. So like you said, it was a lot to, lot to, lot to present. It was a great presentation and a lot of information. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any questions? I've got some questions about now how do you... Uh, Obtain your contact with the influencers. You That's a great, great question. Um, I have a media database that I pay a lot of money for. My company pays a lot of money for that gives us, um, you know, access to some of the bigger ones. Some of the people I literally I use different hashtags. I look at competitive destinations, and I'm like, oh, they just hosted so and so. Well, maybe I need to check on her and or, or him, or you know, that kind of thing. So, um, sometimes Visit North Carolina does a really good job of inviting influencers to their events. Um, when I'm traveling and I'm out, I'm always looking to see, you know, I'll, I'll just literally Google, you know, blogs and you know, best travel blogs in North Carolina or in Wilmington or whatever. I, I just found out there's a there's a really great North Carolina influencer I've been following forever, and I just realized she was at Topsail Island, and so she and I are talking very soon. So uh, it's a lot of research and, and poking at stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Have you noticed, or is there, I've got a little bit of experience now with a, an Airbnb that, at the beach, and so I've started to notice states that seem to favor North Carolina. Visitors from, I don't know, Ohio and Pennsylvania suddenly st stand out to me. Is there, is that a fact or am Maybe I just imagining Maybe it's from that? our fourth quarter market. <laughs> <laughs> it could have. Well, and the reason we targeted Ohio and Pennsylvania oh, yeah. in some of that fourth quarter marketing is because um, that corridor, I-77 and down, is a major pathway to the beach for those Midwestern states. Yeah. Pennsylvania and Ohio have dense population centers, and so we're, we're getting more from them. I mean, you could almost, on a Steelers Carolina Panthers game day, there's almost more yellow jerseys in Charlotte than there are, you know, um, Carolina Panthers jerseys because so many people have relocated into Charlotte and into the Carolinas um, from those places. And so if you look at those major roadways here, um, th that's where that's coming from. It, it's, it's, a, it's a straight shot and we're some of the per best perceived be beaches for those people. They don't love jagging off and going far that'd be east, uh, into the Virginia beaches, some do, but they love their North Carolina beaches. And if you look at the states who refer travel to North Carolina, both Ohio and Pennsylvania are always in the top five. Yeah, it is for the for beach destinations, period. It, Ohio and Pennsylvania are big. Yeah. Had to be for me to notice it. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good information, though. <laughs> Uh, Randy, if that ever changes, you need to tell us. Uh, no, you tell me. Our survey of Randy. <laughs> anyway, so any other questions, comments? It's yeah. great. Um, I agree with you completely that I, I feel that time is of the essence when it comes particularly to summer uh, 2021, um, that, and that does need to be secured now. Any thoughts on how we would, you know, we're always competing with our marketing. We're always trying to drive people here. But in something, I guess, like um, name recognition, I, I spoke to a friend of mine the other night, and, and his, his question to me was, is that near Wilmington? Mm -hmm. You know, so as you mentioned with, like, Onslow County and people being more familiar with the city rather than the county, 
how would how would what's your suggestion with competing with that type of recognition to keep that top of mind awareness That's when they think about question. Eastern North Carolina? Well, an interesting people know Wilmington and people know New Bern. They don't know Jacksonville. Yeah. So a lot of times in our positioning, one thing that we do is we say located on the east coast of North Carolina between Wilmington and New Bern. I'm not giving them a plug that they hadn't already you know, had in their head, that makes sense. we're letting them know geographically where we are because that's what they want to know first. Where the heck is Jacksonville? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you the times I'm in Raleigh and, you know, somebody will say, well, where are you from? Jacksonville, North Carolina, because I know what's coming out of their mouth next. Cool. And they'll say Jacksonville, North Carolina. And as soon as you say between Wilmington and Newburn, they, it kind of clicks. Or if you say, in some cases, you can say Camp Lejeune, the Marine base. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. So you just have to continuously plug that and, and try to let people know, first of all, that we're here and that's where we are geographically and what we have to offer. We have to continuously let them know what we have to offer. And I'll tell you, we're not as expensive as Wilmington. I don't know what you guys do. But we're not what? As expensive as oh. Wilmington. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to say that on television, but Wilmington is, you know, even their beach rentals. I mean, go to Wrightsville or Carolina Beach. It's, it's a lot higher. So we have an advantage. And make a couple of comments. One of the things I've asked the ladies to work on is a three-month plan. Uh, assuming that later in the agenda you move forward with ad hoc committees. One of the things I want to, and I hope that you will support, if you don't support it, we won't do it. But I think the strategic initiative ad hoc committee needs to work on a regular basis with the marketing group. Mm -hmm. And these are the type of things we need to discuss. In our office, and Mr. Hagan, I'm sure, experienced this years ago, a, a day does not go by, Rose can tell you, a day does not go by that we don't get a telephone call thinking that we're Jacksonville, Florida. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally. <laughs> Whether it's a complaint to the mayor's office over not being able to get a vaccine or whether it's somebody complaining about a land use issue coming up and they want the mayor and council to oppose it, you gentlemen see those. One of the things that we need to do is differentiate mm -hmm. because when you think of the word Jacksonville, unless you're from here, unfortunately, cool. your mind goes to Florida. <clears throat> so one of the things that we need to do, hopefully with the Strategic Ad Hoc Committee's direction and, and thoughts, is to figure out how we market Jacksonville, North Carolina. Maybe we become the other Jacksonville. <laughs> I don't know. What I do know, though, is this. If I mention to you, uh, let's say, in honor to you, the Red Sox, you automatically know we're talking about a town someplace up north that's just a little bit further than where the Yankees play, right? <laughs> names mean things. And unfortunately, names result in people misinterpreting where the marketing is going. Yeah. What I've asked these ladies to do, and I think they've successfully shown you that today, is we need to come up with three-month actions. Specifically, where are we going to focus our marketing money for the next three months and then the next three months and the next three months? I hope that you like that approach. If you don't like that approach, you know, it's your money. We're, we're just the staff that, that's going to do what you ask us to do. But I think you can see today these ladies have come up with a plan. The other thing I want you to notice is in the first bullet point up there, the word Jacksonville. From my perspective, if the money is collected from hotels in Jacksonville, all of our efforts should be designed to put heads in the beds in hotels in Jacksonville. And until you say that's not what you want, yes, we're going to cooperate with a lot of other people. But everything that we do should be to accomplish to increase Jacksonville hotel and Airbnb stays. But again, uh, any other questions for these ladies? I think they've done an outstanding job. Yeah, that's great. Well, again, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a question for the for our two hoteliers here. What are you? I mean, are you feeling some increase? Are you seeing some leisure travel? Are you seeing your um, overnight stays increasing? How? What's your world like right now, locally? Well. I think you get two different perspectives from him and me. He's probably more leisure to corporate, and I'm probably a little bit leisure to blue collar. Um, we do get leisure. Uh, I, I, I do agree that most reservations are coming online. 
I don't think that I think that's been a steady increase for for years, and I don't think that's going to go backward. Um, I think the three month makes sense because most reservations are made in about ten to twelve week periods. You know, out from when they see something, they look now, then they buy later. It's pulling the thread. We're just trying to keep pulling the thread till we get that deal. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, compared to last year at this time. Yeah, we're seeing an increase, um, but it, it's ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we're going to have a much better April, Gail. <laughs> at least from what I can forecast from my end, I'm uh, happy to say that it looks much, much, much better. I don't know if we're talking about 2019, but, you know, much improved over what just went through. And um, uh, I think as, uh, you know, we, we talked about the base, but the base brings us not only, they bring us construction business, mm -hmm. they bring us, as we've done stated, families come and see in their Marine, uh, come and see their grandkids, all that good stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the bow's getting ready to break, that we start seeing that really start to flow mm -hmm. on my end. So, Yeah, and I think I, I appreciate him using ebb and flow because I think that even though we might see a rise in the market temperature, you know, I'm very cautiously optimistic these days with yep. that um, because we all know how quickly that can pivot. Very quick. Um, and, and same with marketing. I do think that we should, particularly 90 days, um, but I think we should, you know, be, be ready to, to pivot at any given moment and be able to respond because the timing, mm -hmm. your marketers, I don't have to tell you, it's just everything. It's very precise. It's very targeted. Um, and responding to something, responding to something after the fact, will it just, it will not work. You don't catch up. And we have to pivot quick. Uh, at least I know I do. <laughs> we we don't have three months to pivot. We when we see if, if we can kind of see that that ebb and is going down, we got to jump with marketing, sales, ads, disc, and anything we can increase that that stay and increase the influx. It's just every day. Yeah, so acute. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, one interesting thing that occurred to me that part of the reason I, I came down not just to talk to you all, but it's just I felt like I needed to actually be in our market and look at it with writer eyes because so much of our population here is young and at the base and they're already vaccinated mm -hmm. in Charlotte. People that are that young are still super in mask and totally working from home. Right. And so I've got to like help my travel writers understand it's not that there's total disregard for COVID precautions. This is your military community protecting America. They're vaccinated. So they're not acting the same as they'll be acting in Raleigh or Charlotte. And that's something I picked up in the last 24 right. hours. It's those that. little things like that that we can explain to somebody because it would be really easy to make a really wrong assumption, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People here just don't care about safety. I'm never going back to Jacksonville. That's the last thing we want someone to think about. And so, and to address that fact, we're also, um, we're, we're talking, I'm, I'm gonna work with Chris tomorrow on a video. I worked with the people at Marriott Courtyard. I'll be happy to come see you next time or soon, Rick, and get some videos out there just about how important the safety standards are at our hotels. Well, there's an article in the paper today that referenced Oslo, Carteret, and one of the counties being one of the, the leaders as Good. far as the, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I'm yeah. struggling to get my parents vaccinated in Tennessee right now. And it's been very difficult to even find somewhere where within an hour radius that they can even go to. So, I mean, that's an interesting point. And on that note, is there anything that we have discussed as an authority that could, you know, particularly with that messaging and the way this community is it has responded. It's always been resilient. We've always talked about the resilience of, of this area. But such as, you know, I've always been a big advocate for anything arts related or, you know, music festival. Is there anything like that that would be at the top of the list that, that we could do to help incorporate into that marketing and then doing something tangibly, making a change here, maybe initiate, maybe creating a new festival that we've not had before, uh -huh. or, or gauging what the, the interest in that would be. I, I think uh, Dr. Woodruff probably could speak to this a little bit more than I could, but you know, the support that you guys and the city give the Arts Council um, is, is critical 
because they are at the root of a lot of that type of development. Um, and I know they're working on their one event and, and they had it a couple years and it was pretty successful the second year um, as it was growing and then, you know, things blew up. So um, they're looking at doing that again this year, hopefully in the fall, but he's super precautious you know, or super cautious rather of, you know, do we do it? Do we not do it? But I think as vaccinations are, you know, uh, numbers are on the decline you know, people feel good economically, then I, I think we'll see that some of those definitely, everybody I've talked to already is already asking me about the applications and can they, you know, apply now and, you know, can they plan their event for the fall? So it's going to be a lot of competition in the fall. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to make sure that we put those marketing dollars to good use. But I, that's my take on the art part of it. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing to address your point, sir, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing in the law that I have read that prohibits you as an authority from actually sponsoring events. You know, what you currently do is enable a lot of other people to have events. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you an example. Uh, the Sports Commission, I think Scott does an outstanding job with the Sports Commission actually doing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with this TDA doing. You don't have to be an enabler. You may decide that what you want to do, and I'm just going to make something up because I saw a TV ad last night with balloons on it. Now, with all the wind over here, I'm not so sure a balloon <laughs> fest is a good idea, but uh, the point is, you may decide that one thing that you want to start doing is having an annual balloon fest. Now, again, because of the wind, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. I'm not so sure the base would like balloons landing on the airfield. <laughs> the point I'm making, though, is working through your ad hoc committees or working through you giving more direction and deciding how you want these dollars spent, we can move from marketing and advertising other people's events to actually holding events that you come up with and I think that's the point. Uh, I will end this comment this way. Probably seven or eight years ago, the city council decided that they were going to start sponsoring three free events for this community a year. National Night Out has always been around, so that was one of them. But the city council decided that they were going to fund Winterfest and make everything there free other than the food you wanted to buy. They also decided that they would have Jacksonville Jamboree in May. And once again, everything would be free there other than the food. You, as an authority, can do the same thing. Y'all can decide that you're going to spend, just to pick a number, you're going to spend $50,000 to put on some big event that is going to become your annual event to drive hotel stays. And that's the type of strategic thinking that we're either going to do through the ad hoc committees and then to the full group, or with the full group giving us some thought. Does that, is that something that's a very, my, you know, my question was directed over a long term, obviously not a big festival this year, but, you know, like our discussions we've had regarding downtown. I mean, you know, is there any area we should start looking at now that's, that's leading toward that direction? Mm -hmm. I will say one of the, the ideas that came out of our marketing efforts was Veterans Tribute Weekend. I mean, I, I still think that our timing has been terrible because of, you know, COVID and some things like that. But that was one of those types of, of initiatives that came out of the, this group here. Veterans? Yeah. Very good. Good information Thank and you. good discussion like that. Anyway, I um, guess we're ready to move on to our next order of business, uh, old business, a uh, discussion of the ad hoc committees. I guess we've had some discussion here amongst ourselves on individuals. I've talked to several people, everybody up here so far, and I found pretty much unanimity is in favor of the ad hoc committee concept and have uh, actually gotten, trying to get people in their best talents. So I've uh, Talk to Ken and, and Robert about the uh, the capital side, the capital ad hoc committee, and Rick and Chris on the uh, what do we call it strategic committee. So I think everybody's 
ready since we know it's a temporary. <laughs> that always makes it nice. If it's not working, it won't, we don't have to keep it up. But I'm excited about trying it. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to Ernie Wright, and, unless you've heard from him. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, you asked me to uh, try to reach him, and I did through text, and he's gotten back because you said whatever committee he would like to serve on, you would serve on the other. And he's texted back that he would like to serve on the Capitol uh, Committee. Okay. So if that was, uh, would place you on the strategic, and it, if it's, uh, maybe a motion would be appropriate to establish the two committees, if that's what the TDA would like to do, the strategic committee having Chairman Thomas, Mr. Young, and Mr. Davis on it, and the Capitol Improvement uh, committee, ad hoc committee, having Vice Chairman Hagan, Mr. Warden, and Mr. Wright on it. Well, that sounds like an efficient plan there. Uh, I, would, I would suggest, I mean, I would think that maybe a hotelier on each um, rather than, because that way you're going you're gonna to have a different perspective added on, on both sides of that. Um, you know, I wouldn't have a, a preference on either, but I think it, it came to mind when you mentioned Ernie, and he said, well, whichever one you're on, I'll be on the other one. And yeah. If, you, if you'd like to change, Mr. Davis, uh, Mr. Uh, Wright indicated he'd be willing to serve. And this may be, just for the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, to have a motion, but to change it, let me go over what strategic ad hoc committee would have Chairman Thomas, Mr. Young, and Mr. Wright on it. And Mr. Wright said he would serve on either, but his preference was capital, but he said he would serve on either. And on the Capital Improvement Ad Hoc Committee would have Vice Chairman Hagan, Mr. Warden, and Mr. Davis. Does that sit better with? Well, and I guess I guess you should respond. I, I, was, I, was, kind of, I was actually hoping that you two would start out with the promotion because you're so close to that. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I, so, but. That's, uh, to me, a natural, uh, kind of a natural flow of things. I, I appreciate what you're saying. The, the capital aspect is we've got some kind of history there too with uh you know his background his your background with the different things but and we don't have to like i said nothing said in i mean we can start it today and over time like quarterly revisit it it's no you're not locked in for a term per se uh, but i personally I was, I was most excited about having your two expertise on the on the strategic promotional side of it since that's that's where you live I, I mean i'll be willing to to switch it around if you feel that strongly about getting off of it's it it's not a it's just i mean that was the thought that popped in my right. my mind when it came to the two committees and then rick and i on the i agree there's going to be value on it but i just i think there that perspective and that collaboration could be beneficial to each but it's not that i'm you know right well maybe we could just plan on a you know a six-month assessment and then mix it up you know you want to go back and <clears throat> forth and if somebody has a a desire to to change then then we could you know adapt if if need be or still want to do that okay but i appreciate that appreciate it a lot so Anyway, yeah, we'll go yes, back to you. So, Mr. Chairman, if, if I'm under, if I'm reading my board correctly, <laughs> okay. and I may not be. Let me say that up front. <laughs> but if I'm reading the, the board correctly, on the strategic ad hoc committee would be Chairman Thomas, Mr. Young, and Mr. Davis, and on the capital improvement ad hoc committee would be Vice Chairman Hagan, Mr. Warden, and Mr. Wright. And if you could put the, someone could put that in a motion for me, if I'm reading you correctly now, uh, and get it seconded, and then like you say, if you want to set a time period, Mr. Chairman or the board. You can certainly do that also in, in that motion. So moved. Is there a time period, Mr. Hagan, you wanted to put, or just establish them now until? No, change? I think it'll take both committees some period of time just to work their way through whatever sits on the table, if you will. So I, I don't have a problem with that. And the other comment I would make would be that as we get into this a little deeper, nothing would prevent us from moving people, not moving them, but having people come in uh, to talk about whatever we need to talk about with the other members. So I, I don't I don't think that's a big problem right now. The only thing I want to say, I want to say this for the viewing public as much as for the board, and I think you know this, at, at the, you, each committee has three members. That's not a quorum. Each ad hoc committee is an advisory committee that's going to come back with, after you brainstorm, after you drill down on strategic ideas, on capital, uh, ideas, you're going to come back to the full board and, quote, try to sell the full board on this is the way we should proceed, et cetera. So, but again, and I don't, we, we need to at least keep 
the membership, now you can certainly bring in other folks, such as these ladies here as far as strategic, <clears throat> but the membership should be no more than three on each ad hoc committee so you don't violate the open meetings laws. No, I agree. Okay. okay. So I think, Mr. Chairman, you have a motion. We have a motion. Need a second. Second. I, I think uh, oh. I think he seconded. Oh, you did second it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, great. I'll third it. Third it? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Second and third. All in favor? Sing about saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. All right. Very good. Look we'll forward to that. We'll uh, obviously have some details <laughs> to work out for the future. Okay. Then uh, our fifth item of business is a draft of the funding applications. And Dr. Mr. Bruker. Chairman, you'll remember at the uh, last meeting that uh, we passed out the draft of two applications. One is an application where someone is having an event and they want money to help promote that event. The second is the application for organizations that want what I would call annual support, so organizational support. Mr. Chairman, I believe you were the gentleman who asked that we come up with some samples. Right. So what you'll find in front of you are three samples. Now, I will tell you, these are not real. Uh, and what we'd like to do is have you look at these for a moment. The, the purpose, though, of each application is to make sure that the material that we're asking for on anyone who's asking for funding either as an organization or to promote an event, is the information that you feel you need in order to determine should you or should you not promote that. So what I'd like to do is walk you through the first one, which is promotions. Now, tongue in cheek, some of this is written. For example, on promotions. The first organization is the Eastern North Carolina Dog Runners Association. Their address is 100 Hound Dog Lane. You can see their email address, and the contact person is Billy Bassett, not to be confused with a certain type of dog. They're asking for $10,000. As I walk through the next things, I want you to think about, is this person or organization actually providing the right information that would want me, meaning you as a director, to consider spending $10,000? So let's walk through what their application is saying. The event will promote tourism in Jacksonville and Onslow County in the following ways. A, dog running is a national pastime for dog trainers. B, this two-day event will focus on Eastern United States dog trainers. C, the event is a sanctioned national event. D, in order to compete at the national championships for a national title, all trainers must enter and place in the top 10 positions in a minimum of four sanctioned events. E, there are only seven sanctioned events nationwide. F, in the past, the closest sanctioned event was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. At that event, over 1,000 trainers were entered, and of those, 200 were North Carolina residents or trainers. Let's look a little further. When? Saturday, Sunday, September 4th, 5th. Location? Hoffman Forest. Projected attendees? 500. Projected room nights? 200. Explain the basis for the projected attendance? and the basis of the projected hotel nights. <clears throat> Explanation. The attendance projection is based upon the last three years of attendance for sanctioned events held in Chattanooga, Tennessee. September of 18, 1,220 attendees with 631 room nights. September of 2019, 1,023 attendees, 564 room, night, room nights. September of 2020, 302 attendees, 86 room nights with the note that the pandemic had a major impact. Now, number 12, if you receive funding from, F, from uh, the TDA in 21, please provide. Well, obviously they didn't. This is their first time applying. Then you can see the additional information. So what I'm asking you is, 
if this application is in front of you, what did you find as valuable information? What did you find was not worth anything? And what would you like to have found that wasn't in the application? Well, look, looking at the application, uh, the first thing I go to, of course, is the room nights. How many room nights is this event going to generate? Um, then I go to what are the qualifications of the people that are asking for the money? And um, I, I go from there. In this particular case, uh, there's actually, in just my opinion, there's probably more information in Section 6 than I would need. Uh, it does explain it's a national championship, and, and that catches your eye because we do want to have those kinds of events. But I certainly, um, the information that is supplied on the second page that tells us what happened in Chattanooga with this event is very important to me because it says, okay, there is a market out there in this arena, and if we can, uh, if, if we're comfortable with the people that are presenting this to us, then we have an opportunity to put heads on bids. That's what I received out of this. Thank you. Uh, it's giving you a proven track record of providing rooms. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the thing I would mention, and we've done this in the past, we have to be prepared to take a leap of faith. Because, and, and this is a really good example, because I have... No idea whether we have, do we really have a dog training? Is this, I know this is fictitious, but is there an organization that really exists that does this kind of stuff? That would be my first question. And then if there is, you know, we need to be educated a little bit. Um, but I, I would be interested in how successful the people that are presenting this to us are going to be able to pull this off. Now, the leap of faith comes in, this is the first time they've asked for anything from us. So we have to determine, is this something we want to get involved with? And are we willing to take a leap of faith and maybe put some money and not get the results that they say? Because next year we're not going to fund it. That's my thoughts on the first one. The second thing I would say, I think, well, the first page, I think I would be very skeptical on the numbers until I get to the second page. So the second page is really very important, and that's the event that was held in Chattanooga. Of course, the question becomes, what does Chattanooga have? We don't, and how can we be successful? But it's, the second page tells me this is a legitimate organization. This is a legitimate uh, event, and we need to look at it seriously. On the second page, you could check with Chattanooga, probably with their chamber, their visitors, and find out this information is actually legit. So. Any information that you would like to have seen that's not on here? Not really. Pretty much detail. And so if we had approved this theoretical, then we would turn it, turn the funds over to our, our marketing people and they would do the promotions. Is that what I'm reading? That is correct. That? If you look at the bottom of the second page, it says general information. Promotional funds are for advertising, marketing, and promoting events within the city of Jacksonville. All other expenses are specifically prohibited. Number two, promotional funds are paid to a JTDA meaning you, marketing firm. No funds are paid directly nor indirectly to the event sponsor, grant recipient. So all funds are always under the control of what I'm going to call your agents. Sure. Well, I think that's important that we keep a continuity there. That Yes. Well, if I'm reading that right, then uh, we, we're not allowed to help with any of the expenses of running the, uh, that, that event that day. What do you mean? What do you mean by what? Make give us an example. Well, I mean, I'm, 
you know, let's let's say uh, um, let's say they need uh, they need to feed the volunteers, or um, they, maybe they maybe the uh, they need to pay the city police for overtime for traffic control or something. I know we sometimes do that, but I mean, just just say we decided we didn't want to. I don't know. Maybe they need to rent tents, and 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 they don't have the money to to do that. I'm just. Well, that would be part of their budget, in my opinion, part of their budget application. It, well, that's that what I'm saying. Be, that way that I'm is. reading this thing is saying just promotions only. I was just curious if could we, are we allowed to, cut, to help cover expenses? Well, this statement, um, let me tell you where that statement came from. This statement's actually in your, in the document that has been available for the last three years for anyone who wants marketing money. So... You know, the, the promotion side, uh, I suppose that you could uh, take some of the promotion side or certainly some of the uh, tourism-related side and do something like rent tents for them. On the other hand, the, if the goal is to put heads on beds, it's the marketing that's going to get the people there. And most of these events have an entry fee. So it's the entry fee that generates the money to do the things such as renting timing machines for runs or tents. Uh, ladies, you have any thoughts, so? Uh, I might chime in and say that you're also opening Pandora's box. Okay. Um, okay. I represent you in your best interest. We've always just done marketing. I can't tell you how many events most of them come in and say, oh, well, you know, I want to pay for posters. Mm, we don't pay for posters. You know, you're putting a poster up promoting next year. I get it. Um, or can you help us pay for the entertainment? Onslow County can do that. It's my understanding, and John would have to look into it. Um, Onslow County can do whatever they want to. They can give the Shrimp Festival money to have the Shrimp Festival. Ours has been speci specified for marketing to make sure that we're reaching out the best way we can to invite people to the event who will stay in our hotels. And I don't, I'm, I'm new to the, obviously I'm new to the board and really is more of an, uh, just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. So, so traditionally we've not paid any help with expenses and yet, yeah, we do have funding. So for, for profit, well, let's say it was a nonprofit, uh, this, this dog hunters, maybe a dog, uh, dog runners, maybe a nonprofit, you know, we're given funding requests which doesn't include, I mean, which is really, I guess, different money, but that's what I'm asking. I know we've got different pots of money, but can, could could somebody submit two applications, one for the promotion side and one for the the operational side? That's, that's mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, Warren, I think you, if my packet's like yours, if you go into the the next two, Th uh, those are those are those are operational. Yes. Yes, sir. Then that that's money that they come in and say that they would like, and whether you know for, for salaries or as you say different okay. things here. So, so okay. let's go just a moment. Go back to the. Again, your promotion money can be spent by you in your discretion and authority if you believe that that money is going to put heads on beds. Now, again, like Teresa is saying, th th there's been different applications, I think, in the past. There's applications for promotion, like Richard's application here with those requirements, and then there's been other applications where you have allocated X amount of money to these nonprofits because you believe that their actions are putting heads on beds. Sturgeon City, the uh, Sports Commission, as well as some others have been considered because I believe Teresa and you and maybe Susan both have sat on some little com committees and reviewed those applications. So to answer your question, yes, sir, you can go beyond truly that and have gone beyond it, but it's kind of a different application uh, and so forth. And I Teresa, think it comes me. from different money, correct? I, I, I don't know where I the money it comes, comes from, that's y'all. <laughs> Gail? Um, yeah, I think all that money did come out of the um, promotion yeah. pot. Okay. Same, two-thirds or one-third pot, whatever you're talking about, one year. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can mix the money the way that it's been described, but I, may, I mean, I might be wrong, but... I, I agree. We have done that over the years, and I, I think we should continue to do that. But I think it's also more important that the organization that brings the information to us specifies in there. Where is going? Let's take $50,000 as an example. If they want to tell us exactly what they should tell us, 
when they tell us what they're going to use it for, that's when they need to tell us that it's for this, it's for this, and it's for this. It's not our job to... I don't view our job as saying to them, well, you you haven't put anything in here about uh, the police. It's Have you researched that? That's their job to do that. Mm-hmm. One more point. And I think, again... Besides the promotional application, there is application that nonprofits in particular have come forward with and here. For example, if they want to rent tents, we don't give the, in the past, and Gail will correct me if I'm wrong, we have not written checks to the organization to pay. We pay the tent provider. And I, if, again, they make an itemized list of those kind of things they'd like to have help with, and all that money does come out, as Gail said, out of the promotion money. But there's a couple of types of different applications. I would... I would, and I'm certainly the newest one in this. You all have spent many more hours. I would heed what she just said. When you start going beyond marketing money on events, and I'm not talking about the organizational support, but when you go beyond marketing money on events, you are opening Pandora's box. I agree. I, my... my my recommendation to you is listen to what Teresa is saying to you, and at least for the next round, let's keep it to what it says. Promotional funds are for advertising, marketing, and promoting events within the city. All other expenses are prohibited. If you need to rent tents, if, if, you're, if your event is so unsuccessful that you can't cover the cost of police or renting or garbage collection or set up or security. You're not going to get any money. No. We haven't had issues with those in particular, but you might have a case where someone will come in and ask me and put me in the position of coming back to you and saying, you know, they want to spend, you know, 75% of the money on their entertainment because that's going to be a draw. Well, that's not necessarily going to put heads on beds unless it's, you know, Kenny Chesney or somebody, you know. So in that case, it's a whole different ball game. But you're, it's, it's, it could present problems. But if you have a completely separate application for that, you know, that's, that's something that you guys well, can Well, actually, we, we don't. What we have, what's in the packet, we can have a third application. What we have right now is an event promotion mm-hmm. application and then an organizational support application. The organizational support application is intended to be the things that the Sports Commission, Sturgeon City, uh, would annually fill out any other organization that wants your support. Now, if, if the committee, I mean, we work for you all, so if you want a third application or if you want the promotion application modified where you can spend that money on things other than advertising, give us direction. Seems like a lot of these events are essentially fundraisers for the organization. So if you're giving them money that they're covering their expenses, then you're just fundraising for them. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, the event itself needs to at least break even or cover their own expenses uh, because you, like I said, you get into a, a, a kind of a gray area where you're you, you've lost that arm's length separation, you know, all of a sudden, what if they underestimated their expenses? Are they going to come back and say, well, you said you'd help us with that. And so now that's more than we expected. So I'm happy to stay with the status quo on the promotional event side of it. I mean, there's obviously... And to date, we haven't had any events that have, have failed, you know, or haven't been able to pay their way. We have not experienced any big issues with any of the events. There have been a couple times that, you know, I'm not involved and things are paid for additionally, but not in this particular pot of money, uh, out of that pot of money, but not in the promotional fund that they're awarded grant-wise. So um, we haven't had any problems yet. I don't know where this comes into play, and I don't know if it needs to be on this, on on the original application, but we need to have a space for them to give us feedback after they after we funded them and after they've had the event to tell us officially how many heads on beds were created after action. They have a post report, correct? Yes. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, that needs to be part of the 
part of the written stuff somewhere. I don't know if you do it here. And, and somebody's got to follow up on that too. Uh, you know, well, we definitely we definitely need to do that. In the interest of time, uh, the second application is from the estuary. I think you would find it's very well done. Let's spend your time on the third application, and that is coastal runners. I think you're going to find a lot of concern with this one, and that's why I think it's important to go through it. Now, this is a nonprofit organization asking for organizational support, not an event particularly. The name of the organization is Coastal Runners. You can see their address, email. The per contact person is Seems Fast. <laughs> The amount they want is $50,000. Please provide an itemized proposed expenditure breakdown. They want $20,000 for salary for part-time employees for event planning, $10,000 for office space rental and utilities, $15,000 for timing equipment, event tents, cones, and T-shirts, and $5,000 for marketing. Number seven, please provide a narrative. These funds will be utilized to start up a new organization focused on establishing a minimum of three race events in Jacksonville and Onslow County. From events held in the area, it is obvious that this is a running community and that events organized and managed by coastal runners will be well supported by the local citizens. While our focus will be local runners, it is projected that 10% of the runners will be from outside the county. They didn't get any funds last year. They've attached the, it says, please attach a copy of the organization's latest IRS Form 990. The organization's in the process of just filing its nonprofit status. And then you see, please attach to your application other information. Seems Fast has just retired after 20 years of service as a Marine, participated in the run for the Warriors in 2020, was a high school track star in long distance and cross country. Mr. Davis, how do you feel about giving them $50,000? Well, you know, just as, a, just as happy as I am to give anybody $50,000. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think this is a good move. What are your thoughts? How would you feel about this? Well, my, my first thought is I send this to the Sports Commission. No, seriously. I mean, it's a, it's a running event. We give them money to have running events. So I, I send this right back to them. But uh, we, we do not fund this. First of all, it's focused on local and only 10%. That's not going to justify 50K. No. And then I don't I think they're going to need more money to market it than 5K. So, well, it seems like this, this application you go right into running fast as pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least 40,000 of it, the way I read yeah. And that's not what we're all about. But this, this one will be rejected, I can tell you that. I mean, let's say you got 200 runners and 10% is only. That's not a lot of head. Well, bed. nowhere in here does it say how many room nights they're going to create. No. No. So how many estimated to be there? Only 10% of it's going to be from outside the county. So. Now, I will say this. If we got this application, and even with that 10%, if they were asking for, say, $2,000, it should be considered once they get their nonprofit status. Well, then, the, then the other thing to think of is this. This application, in my opinion, would be turned down for support as a nonprofit organization. On the other hand, if they wanted to reapply as a promotion activity where they wanted $2,000 to help market it, then that may be something different for you. You know, these applications obviously were fictitious. Uh, John made them up, and I enjoyed reading them. Good job, John. <laughs> Good job. Ah. So he says he actually knows a man named Seems Fast. But um, all right. What I'd like to ask, though, is is uh, is direction. It is coming up on budget time for a lot of these organizations, such as Sturgeon City, 
and the uh, Sports Commission. We need to, if you're comfortable, on the organizational support, we would like to go ahead and send these out to those two organizations and anyone else who would like to apply so that we can be getting the information in, reviewing them with you, and then you can decide, certainly before June 30th, are you going to be recommending funding, and if so, at what level? Absolutely. How about the, um, I guess the event people are just still on hold. They're too unsure to commit to a, I mean, something well, like. You know, with, with the governor's uh, latest order, I, you know, I think society is beginning to, to wake up, and that's going to impact a lot of things. So even if you're, I think the good suggestions that were mentioned on how we would modify the promotions part, we should begin to let people know that there's going to be a filing period. One of the questions that, has, uh, that uh, Kim uh, Tillman has brought up is are we going to have, I think you should have for organizational support only a certain time of the year that you accept those applications. On the other hand, for promotions, uh, you can decide do you want that open only a certain time of the year or do you want it to be open whenever? Because there may be events that someone uh, is not thinking of today that they would like to do in February of next year, but they may not think of it until, let's say, November, and it might still be a worthwhile. So what is your thinking about the windows of opportunities for the two different types of support? Well, we need to keep that window open throughout the 12 months. For the promotion, sir? Correct. Mm -hmm. And for organizational support, just once a year, or do you want that open? For budgetary reasons, once, you know, a window before the budget's finalized. Would be Who would fall into that category? Sturgeon City and the uh, Sports Commission are the only two currently. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. Once a year. So once, once a year for them in budget time, and then promotionals year-round. Is that what we're reading? Yeah. Agreed. Mr. Chairman, staff has nothing else. All right. Good, because we're pushing the limit here, five o'clock. <laughs> anyway, uh, any director's comments? I know we've had a great meeting. I'm glad to have everybody here and hope Ernie gets well soon and see him next time and definitely be in touch with him. If we're going to, you know, particularly with the marketing, if we're going to look at it over a three-month period um, and obviously with the information we got today, um, if we should plan on, you know, Teresa and then coming back to visit us next month or, you know, particularly over the next few to get the updates. Who knows what's going to happen between now and, and then. And, you know, rather than all that, particularly in this period, rather than catching up and absorbing everything, it, staying in real time, you know, up to date on it. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, one of the, now that you've established the ad hoc committees, uh, within the next several days, we'll be trying to organize those ad hoc committees and beginning to get, in, in your particular case, you were talking about the marketing side, beginning to get that group to work with uh, Teresa and Susan and the staff to begin to really dig down into the marketing strategies. So, uh, you know, you, you may not see them, you know, the next meeting would be April 29th. You may or may not see them then, but believe me, between now and April 29th, uh, the Strategic Marketing Committee is going to be having uh, either some, whatever you call these virtual meetings. What do you call them, Susan? Meeting, yeah, virtual, virtual meetings. Virtual yes. meetings? Uh -huh. Okay, you're supposed to say something like Zoom or Team or oh. whatever. <laughs> you know, we will be setting those up for y'all to begin to work teams. directly on those Microsoft marketing teams. things. But again, we can have them here as often as you want. Yeah. Well, I do have a comment before we leave. I, it, it's very obvious that we would not be as successful as we are without these two ladies. Amen. And Kim Tillman. Too. Yes. <laughs> well, the whole support staff, the city included, we couldn't do our jobs at all. We, we, we would be spinning in the wind. But it's very obvious that the help that we get from them guides and leads us to where we want to go and they 
in my opinion at least, do a great job and have done a great job. So I just want to say that. Thank you so right much. Right here. That's great. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right.